Wie lange haben Sie für die Titanic gebraucht? Die hat sehr aufwendig ausgeschaut. Also es waren ungefähr 400 Stunden, die es benötigt hat. Wir hatten einen Zeitraum von zweieinhalb Monaten Zeit, das umzusetzen. Mit der tatsächlichen, also wenn man die National Geographic Ausgabe hat, die Online Ausgabe, man kann sich da genau, also wie als wenn man die in einem 3D Raum hätte, um dieses Modell rumbewegen. Also für diese gesamte Umsetzung haben wir zweieinhalb Monate benötigt. Danke. Da stelle ich gleich noch eine Frage hinterher. Habt ihr irgendwelche Erkenntnisse darüber, inwieweit National Geographic dann tatsächlich darüber auch zusätzliche Kunden gewinnt? Ähm, bei National Geographic ist es, sage ich mir jetzt mal, nicht ganz so wichtig, wie viele Kunden die haben, weil es ist einfach eine Stiftung, die ist einfach nicht davon lebt, dass sie schauen müssen, wie viel sie verkaufen, sondern dass sie halt möglichst außergewöhnliche Projekte durchführen. Ähm, aber da haben wir, also um es dann so knapp zu beantworten, keine Kenntnis darüber. Oh. <lacht> Gibt es noch weitere Fragen? Aber wir wissen zumindest, dass RMS Titanic, die die Rechte an der Titanic haben ähm, oder so weit hatten, ähm, diese äh, Umsetzung, also es ist die einzige und realistische und genaueste Darstellung, die im Moment von dem Ist-Zustand existiert. Okay. Ja, dann ganz lieben Dank, Stefan. I um, want to welcome the only English-speaking uh, speaker today, um, Carla Zamponi. Please come on stage. Um, you are a data visualization specialist, I think. It's the right uh, description at Nokia at the moment. Um, and um, as far as I know, you're passionate about everything that mixes design and technology. Yep. So we're looking forward for your talk. Uh, I can recommend everybody to look on his website because uh, fun is what you're going to get there. And looking at the graphics Look. showing where we come from and where we go is uh, really fun and very informative. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my second time in Munich. Uh, the first time I came for Oktoberfest with some friends, the weather was much nicer. And um, today I'm here to talk about the fun of data visualization. But before I go into details, I want to tell you the story. Because I've moved to London recently, and uh, something strange has happened. Because I give per grand that the weather in London is the crappiest you can find. So yesterday I came, and while I was flying, I was landing, I saw the snow, and I realized I didn't check about the weather here. And it was so crazy, I said, okay, come on. When I was living in Italy, it was always checking about the weather, and it's changed so much. So when I landed, it was so cold and crazy, no gloves, no scarf, nothing, because I didn't need that in London. And when I came out of the train, and it was freezing, I had a wonderful surprise. There was an uh, old friend of mine greeting me with his um, welcome. And <laughs> it's, that's the first thing that I saw when I came out of the train. And, and uh, Trapattoni is one of my adults when I was a kid. He was the trainer of my uh, beloved team. And you know, when you're a kid, you only dream about becoming, at least in Italy, a football player. So you go on in your life, and then you realize that there are better players, and you start working with data. And, <laughs> and I ended up um, working in Nokia is, as a data visualization designer. And I am in the consumer intelligence department. So what we have, we have data coming from users, and data from devices, data from services, from surveys, so a uh, lot of stuff coming. And what, what I have to do is to find a way to visualize these uh, feedbacks uh, in, the, in the easiest and best way. And um, for example, in this project, uh, I'm visualizing in real time uh, feedback coming from uh, the users. So uh, when you have a device or a, or a or user service on, on the web from Nokia, you will be asked uh, how you can grade your experience and send a comment. And so this is a visualization of the comments that are coming in real time. So you can see how uh, words, the most used words are popping in and uh, the color represent uh, how 
positive or negative is the comment. And uh, even though it's a very simple type of visualization, it's striking how easy it is to understand which are the most uh, used words and which are the positive and negative. And from here, we have understood that uh, users tend to cluster for negative feedbacks around few issues, while when they talk about positive things, they tend to spread on many more topics. So this type of, 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 of works, even though it's simple, it helped us a lot to understand. And in a large corporation, you can really disrupt with data visualization, because, you know, most of the time people are used to traditional charts and long PowerPoints. And in the case of, of data visualization, especially for the web, when you build interactive tools, you can really create things that help to understand. And in this visualization, I'm showing how people are switching from one brand to the other. So uh, if you think about this small thing, it's showing like almost 60,000 behavior of users and it's just at one glance you can understand uh, where people are moving from one brand so when they leave like basically it's when you buy a new phone so you will leave your uh, old brand and you switch to a new one or maybe you keep so you can uh, really understand the loyalty of users or you can understand how it's different in different countries so china is going to be completely different from uh, germany and uh, also the behavior of people who are buying a smartphone is completely different from the behavior of people who are buying a traditional mobile phone. So uh, when I explain what I do to people, I always end up with this question, Carlo, what do you do? And that's the problem when I have to explain to people what is my job, data visualization. So I have built this technique of three steps. So the first step is I go straight and I say, I am a data visualization designer. And usually what I have back is a blank face. Um, <laughs> people, yeah, they don't understand much. And so I go for the second, quest, second try. And here I really use my hands, not just because I'm Italian, but because I think it, it really helps to use hands to describe. So I say, I take data because I want to visualize them in some way. And <laughs> in this way, Sometimes people tend to understand and ask me more. But if I see, like, again, a blank face, then it's a problem because I have to go and, uh, and go for the long description. <laughs> and I have to explain, uh, yeah, out there, there are a lot of data, and you want to use it because sometimes it's scared to, scared to be in front of the data. And yeah, you want to build this visualization, that's what I do. So it's it's great to describe, but what I really want to do when I describe this is to explain how much fun I have doing it. Because both from the designer side and from the user side, uh, using and dealing with data visualization is a lot of fun. And I've been thinking about this type of fun. So uh, I thought that, I, th I think that there are two levels. One level is the designer side and the other side is the user so on the designer side i really think that the most exciting and fun things is the whole design process so you'll go through a long uh, process from the beginning to the end when you finally publish your um, your work so how how now i will i will try to describe my personal uh, mm, way to, to deal with, with the process. So first of all, I observe what is around me. So when I'm on a train, I go around and I always check if something can be interesting and to be, to be visualized. Or I try to keep updated on the data and read whatever I can read in order to find what can be interesting. And sometimes, instead, I have people coming and asking me, why, why don't we collaborate on something? So what I do, I start to research and study a lot about the data, about what I can do with it. And finally, when you really understand what, what, what you're dealing with, you have this discovery that you finally, you can do something interesting, you can do something cool with the data. And then you start a different pro uh, pr uh, process, which is the one of digging into the data, trying to find out more information, trying to understand it better and better. 
and um, and then then you take it at home. So you take you take the data, you collect it, and you try to. Uh, understand it, and once you have the data with you, you start cuddling the data, uh, taking care of your data, try to understand it better and better. So then it comes a time when uh, you have to double check the data because most of the time you might have uh, holes, problems, stuff that is not working in the data. And only when you have double checked it, then you are very happy with it. It's confirmed, data is good, you can go on working with it. And you tend to mess up with the data, try to mix with other data, make like work on it, and try to uh, find out the best. And what it really do a lot is sketching. I like to sketch, sketch. And this is the part of sketching comes through all the process. So even earlier or even after, I really like to sketch and find new ideas. And uh, finally, I start to prototype. Prototype is uh, a very important part because it, it's, it's a fast way to understand if you are going to the right direction. So I prototype and I prototype more, I test and prototype, and it's a cycle. Until going on, I find um, something that is uh, something that is going on, it's working, it's good. And sometimes during the prototyping phase, you get mad with your work and you want to trash it and work it more. And then finally, working and working, eventually at the end, it works. Finally it works and you have something there, it's working. And it's a like, like a product that you want to share with people. So usually what I do, I share with a small group of people, I want to see their reaction to it. Because it's very important, like, uh, that user testing, and, and then uh, I receive the first feedbacks from people, sometimes I also select people who are experts of the, those data, so they can give me like proper feedbacks. And then, finally, you have to free your project, you have to let it go out uh, on the internet, and let people play with it, and play and interact with your with your project and you receive feedback, you enjoy receiving feedback, it's something that is really important for anyone who makes something. And um, finally, if it's a good thing, you can take it to a conference and show to people and maybe see the reaction on the face of the people. <laughs> so this whole pro uh, process, it's, 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 in my opinion, it's a lot of fun and, and what it leads to, it leads to create tools visualization uh, that help uh, people to find uh, patterns, stories, connection in the data. And where well, we always hear about uh, data visualization simplify, uh, data visualization lets you find patterns, data visualization uh, it's great because you can build your own stories or you can provide stories to, uh, to whoever using your, your tool. But what I think is that the um, interacting with, uh, with, with, with these projects that you do is to be fun. Because in my opinion, interacting with data is fun. My way, it's my own way, so I get excited just seeing some raw data, but I understand that that's not for everyone. So it comes uh, the moment when you, uh, you want this to be easy, to be used by everyone, and that's why you build these, uh, these tools. So, for example, in this project, I'm showing um, migration flows uh, in the world. And apparently, migration data can be, can be boring or tough to understand because there's so many. But with this visualization, I try to build some uh, easy to use and engaging tool to visualize where people are going, where people are coming from. So, for example, USA is the the country where more people are going, and mainly they are from Mexico. And you figure out that Mexico is the country that has more people living. And they're all going to the US. And in Italy, I figured out that Romania is the country where people come uh, from the most. And uh, that was a, a very important for me to uh, explore the data. So at first sight, it was I could not understand all of these things. But with the tool, and playing with the tool, I really get through some insights that were uh, important. Like, for example, I understood that countries like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, or um, the Emirates 
are mainly uh, based on immigrants. For example, Qatar has almost 85% of immigrants. That means that you will find one people from Qatar out of 10, which is incredible. Or, uh, okay, Germany, you have uh, mainly people from Turkey. It's the number one. Well, Italy, just for a time less, is the number two. But uh, country like Saudi Arabia, you have half of the people living there coming from India. So you can, you can imagine that uh, through this uh, visual tool, I could really understand a lot of things that, um, that were hidden to me. And many people could see, could see this while playing with this, with this tool. See, India, you have a lot of people going to the Emirates. On the other side, I've built another mm, visualization that is showing very boring data coming from the United Nations. Every year, United Nations uh, publish a report of how countries are performing on different indicators. So you have uh, health, uh, like uh, living standards, uh, the quality of workplace. And with this visualization, I'm comparing the different countries, and you can see in time how they are performing. So you can see easily that the quality of life is really connected to the uh, workplace equality and education. So you can see in time how they are, they are growing together, especially for emerging countries like India or China. You will see the population is growing a lot. You will see also pollution growing, but especially you can see how education is improving and health and living standards. Or you can see how the U.S. is polluting more than China or, uh, or India, which have a population is much more. And, and this I've, I've tried to visualize with these uh, shapes that change and adding this type of gimmick uh, to, the, to the tool in a way that I, I help people playing with it and having fun with this, with this, with this data. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it can be quite quite tough and boring to deal into to dig into so much data from yeah the United Nations. Um, in this other uh, project, instead, I'm showing completely different stuff. That uh, how people are tweeting in the world. This is a two years old project, and at that time, what I wanted to show was uh, how. I can shape the world through Twitter, so showing a different way. Then, uh, even here, I had a lot of insights because you can. I could understand, uh, okay, not just the countries that are using more Twitter, but you can also understand when they start using it. Like for example, this is yesterday night. Uh, you could see that the most uh, tweeting countries were uh, UK, uh, France, United States and uh, Brazil, I think, that's Rio de Janeiro. But if you check now, you will see Indonesia tweeting a lot. And I figured, I understood that um, in Indonesia, the most used device to tweet is the mobile phone, even two years ago. And, they were, and that's why it was the leading country, because these are all geolocated, um, geolocated uh, tweets. And to add even more fun, I've created this 3D visualization. So if you wear those glasses now, you would see the, this visualization on different layers. And it was uh, very important like for me to understand this. And that actually was probably my first project uh, that uh, really pushed me towards the data visualization world. And this is um, the last project that I want to show you. In a couple of days, there are elections in Italy, and this is a visualization of how people are tweeting about the elections. So each wave is a tweet. The dimension of the, of the wave depends on number of followers and retweets. Uh, it's a real-time visualization, so it happens as we are seeing it. Okay, now it's a video, but anyway. And you can... Uh, drag this thing and read what people are saying and and for which candidates they're talking about. So you can see that many of the tweets talk about more candidates at the same time. 
the color, the, the color um, highlights the different candidates. Uh, and here is a different type of visualization that we split on four lines, sorry, five lines. And uh, what I was thinking is, because this project started when I started, instead of having waves, I had circles. Circles moving from right to left. Then I thought, okay, it can be like a, a kind of curve that slowed down, because I was thinking a tweet is not a circle. A tweet is more like something that starts high, then it goes down as time passes by, because the, the first moment is the one when Everybody sees it. Now Twitter is so fast. So the idea of the waves and the tail of the waves represent uh, the interest around the tweet for the time passing by. And the more follower you have, the longer this, uh, this tail is. And uh, that's, yeah, that's my last project. I've just published it. And uh, as you can see, I had a lot of fun and passion about what I, what I do. And when people ask me, so Carlo, what do you do? Uh, well, the answer, I don't have a universal answer about it. But what I want to c communicate is that, is that I have fun visualizing data. So that's, that's my job, having fun visualizing data. Thank you.